What a, what a joy to be here, um, and I'm so thankful for all that uh, our ears have heard and all that our hearts have felt so far. Uh, I bet you didn't know that Calvin was that revolutionary, did you? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing that we've uh, had the opportunity to learn more about the riches of Scripture and even of the Reformed tradition as, as it reflects the truth of Scripture. I'm going to return to... Um, that quote that uh, Dr. Matt list, lifted up earlier from uh, King's letter from a Birmingham jail, put it in context a little bit more for us. April 3rd, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. sat frustrated in the musky confines of a Birmingham jail cell, not so much frustrated by the hatred of the world as by the apathy of the church. King had just received a letter signed by eight concerned clergy people encouraging the Negro citizens of Birmingham to withdraw support from the nonviolent protest movement and denouncing the movement as unwise, extreme, and untimely. And in a tone dripping with patient indignation, it's amazing how you can have patient indignation, but if you read King's letter, you you, you sense that coming through. Patient indignation. King responded, in the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. Our nation has a very long history of relegating racial and economic injustices to the realm of social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. In her book, The Baptism of Early Virginia, author Rebecca Getz, for instance, chronicles the way in which Anglican colonial planters re-engineered the doctrine and practice of Christian baptism stripping away its practical social dimensions in order to accommodate the racial caste system in America. Sean Michael Lucas has also documented the way in which 19th and 20th century Southern Presbyterians manipulated their doctrine of the spirituality of the church to do essentially the same thing. I want you to notice something. The very fact that uh, these colonial planters and Southern Presbyterians had to manipulate the Reformed doctrine and practice suggests to us that the confessional Reformed tradition as it was handed down to them from the 16th and 17th century Reformers would have in fact upended the social caste system in America. It suggests that, that the gospel that the Reformers preached and as we've heard from, from, from Dr. Matt and Dr. Christen earlier, uh, the, 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 the gospel that they preached, the kingdom that they understood as having been inaugurated through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ made a very real and deep claim upon our social lives. It means to say that Geneva has much more to say to Ferguson than we sometimes realize or want to admit. And the degree to which Reformed and Presbyterian churches in America have historically ignored, accommodated, or exasperated racialized and economic injustices to the degree that they have done that, we've actually not been true to our Reformed roots. Heidelberg Catechism, for instance, in its exposition of the Sixth Commandment, and I'm going to be talking about what the Reformed confessions have to say to racial and economic injustice. I'm going to look here at the Heidelberg Catechism. Heidelberg Catechism, to start, uh, in its exposition of the Sixth Commandment, this is on Lord's Day 40, calls believers to, quote, not belittle, hate, insult, or kill my neighbor, not by my thoughts, my words, my look, or gesture, and certainly not by actual deeds. And I am not to be party to this in others. Certainly, this exposition of the Sixth Commandment also applies to racial and economic realities and injustices. And so I want you to notice that it's not just, it's not just uh, good enough for me to refrain from doing it, but I'm not to be a party of it 
in others, when I see others uh, participating in this, when I see others belittling other racial, racial groups or other uh, uh, groups that are in uh, the poor or, or, or other nationalities, I can't just sit idly by. I can't be a party in it uh, amongst others. I have to positively promote the interests of my diverse neighbors, you see. Zacharias Ursinus, who's the principal author of the Heidelberg Catechism, wrote in his commentary to the Catechism this, whereas the law not only commands us to avoid sins, but also to embrace and practice the contrary to them. In other words, uh, what it means to keep uh, 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 the sixth commandment, for instance, is not just to refrain from murdering our neighbor, but God wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to be patient, peace-loving, gentle, merciful, and friendly toward them, to protect them, he says, uh, uh, from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. When he begins to, to lift up uh, to, to get down into the details of what this looks like. And, and he begins to lift up certain instances of, of ways and virtues which help to conduce toward looking after the well-being of our neighbor. The first virtue he lists is something he calls particular justice. Particular justice. Particular justice, uh, according to, um, to, to Ursinus, involves the unlawful harming of the quality of life or the body of another whether on purpose or through negligence, okay? Not just the body, but the quality of life. If, if, if we, we're forbidden from, from actually uh, 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 negatively impacting not only the bodies, but the quality of life of someone else. This is really interesting. He, he takes this idea and, 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 he, and he presses it a little further into, the, uh, into criminal justice reform, actually. Uh, and, and drawing on Galatians 6.1, you remember Galatians 6.1, which speaks about church discipline and, and the ways in which church discipline ought to be carried out uh, amongst the people of God. Remember, Galatians 6.1 tells us that if, 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 if we find, if someone is caught in a sin, if someone is caught in a sin, then those of us who are spiritual must restore them gently, must restore them gently. And, and, and Ursinus picks up on this, and he, and he lists a virtue he calls equity, of uh, which he says moderates strict justice. This is particularly concerned to protect the dignity of people who have committed crimes while ensuring justice. I want you to think about that. The, 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 the principle that the Lord lays down in the church is that those who are guilty those who have committed sin, those who are, are shown up guilty, when we go and, 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 and we, we correct them, we must do it gently in ways that, 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 that promote their dignity and their well-being, in ways that not only seeks to win the argument, but seeks to win the person. Remember what Scripture says? He who wins souls is wise. Not he who wins arguments is wise, but he who wins souls is wise. And so, Ursinus uh, understands the Sixth Commandment as forbidding excessive force or promoting partiality in the punishment of wrongdoing. This also is drawing on, uh, for instance, Exodus 22, 2 through 3. You all remember in Exodus 22, 2, two through 3, this is, a, this is a, also a, an exposition, this is an application of, of the Sixth Commandment. And it, it's, it's, it's a law that specifically involves what to do in case of home invasion. And you remember in ancient Israel, they didn't have electricity like we do today. And so when nighttime came, nighttime came, okay? And there, there was no night lights. There were no, there were no, there, there was no uh, things that, you know, that would, would light up at night. It was, when it was dark, it was pitch black. And, 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 and so there was a law laid down that, it, that in, 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 in the case uh, of a break-in at night, if someone were to sneak into your, temp, your tent at night and try, to, uh, and try to steal from you at night, uh, uh, if it was pitch black and, it was, and uh, under the cover of night uh, and, and you've in, the, in the defense of your, your safety and of your family, you, you kill them, okay? You were not guilty of bloodshed. You were not, you're not, you're not, you're not, it was not blood guilt brought upon you. But, but, but if the sun had risen on the invader, okay, 
and, and there was enough light to, to, to protect yourself and refrain from killing the person, and you killed them anyway, well, then you were guilty of, you, you had blood guilt upon you. You had blood guilt. But that's really interesting, isn't it? Because even a person that was guilty, right, uh, we, we, were, we are responsible for protecting their dignity. Even people who are guilty are still made in the image of God. And God expects us and commands us to protect their well-being as well. He puts it this way. I love the way he says it. He says, extreme right is extreme wrong. Extreme right is extreme wrong. I just want us to think about uh, what is often at issue in, for instance, these police brutality cases. Okay? It's not just about whether the person was guilty, but whether there was an extreme right pursued. Whether, whether somehow uh, even a person that, 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 that might have uh, 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 done something wrong whether they deserved an extrajudicial killing. These cases that have given rise to, 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 uh, to unrest in Ferguson and Baltimore and Milwaukee and Charlotte, the question has not revolved around the complete guilt or innocence of the victim, but the use of excessive force and the perception of partiality in that force. And so our science argues that excessive force, excessive use of force in the pursuit of justice dishonors the Lord. I think we would do well to remember that. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not judging those cases, okay? What I'm simply saying is that the, the form confessions speak to those things, okay? And it speaks to, to the way in which uh, 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 policing even is done, all right? Uh, and criminal justice is carried out in our land, okay? All right, let's, let's, let's look at something else. The tradition coming out of the Westminster Assembly calls believers to Quote, resist all thoughts and purposes. This is, this is the uh, larger catechism's uh, exposition of the Sixth Commandment. To resist all thoughts and purposes, subdue all passions, and avoid all occasions, temptations, and practices which tend to the unjust taking away of the life of any. It calls us to consider how we can positively affirm the equal dignity and worth of all life. All right, of all uh, life, no matter what, what, what race, uh, no matter what nationality, no matter where they are in the socioeconomic ladder, all life, no matter what gender, no matter what sexual orientation, all life in a society. Uh, and we must protect that life in societies that historically demean those lives. Uh, we have to uphold and, 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 and affirm the equal value and dignity of, of, of men's lives and women's lives, of, 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 of of, of black life and Latino life in all life, of Muslim life, of, of life, because, the, because people, these people are still made in the image of God. And it calls us to positive practical action in the promoting the good of our diverse neighbors and putting to death the temptation and practices that further societal injustices against them. In this list of sins forbidden, Westminster Assembly also includes, this is really interesting, oppression. Oppression. If you look at, uh, at, at what the assembly saw as, as, as part of viol a violation of the Sixth Commandment, it includes societal oppression. And it's interesting because, and I think uh, this has been lifted up a number of times today, that, that the Scriptures don't just call us to, to, to um, right relationships amongst individuals, but a right relationship in society. And, and it's interesting because when the Westminster Assembly lists oppression as part of the sins forbidden, the source text that the assembly included to explain what they meant was Ezekiel 18:18, 18, 18, which describes private forms of oppression. But then they went and used Exodus 1:14, which describes institutional oppression. And it was almost as if the assembly <laughs> said, that, "Now, now." Don't just privatize this. This is not just about the way in which you treat another, one other person, but, th but this is about the way in which we participate in and promote injustices across society. And so they, they actually listed Exodus 1.14 uh, as, as, as the source text. And this is what Exodus 1.14 says. It says, and they, the Egyptians, made their, uh, their, that is the Hebrews, lives bitter with hard bondage 
in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. It's fascinating, again, uh, that the assembly didn't merely spiritualize Israel's bondage in Egypt, but drew on that experience as showing how Christians must practically and societally resist systemic oppression. And it's interesting because they may have written more here. We get the sense that the assembly probably had more to say about this. But, you, but if you consider the context of the assembly, you see, the assembly was convened by the English parliament. And, and, and so as a practical matter, did not want uh, to provoke the convening body by speaking too forcefully about matters of the commonwealth. So, uh, so, so but, but the source text that they left, okay, offers a fascinating clue that the assembly did not merely refer to personal forms of oppression, but social oppression. So you get the sense that here's a parliament, here, here's a parliament that, that calls this assembly together, and, 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 and the, 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 uh, the Westminster divines probably have a lot to say about social oppression, but they know that Big Brother is watching, okay? And so they want to make sure that they, 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 don't, they don't provoke the, the very convening body, but they left a clue. They left a source text to let us know that they understood that, that's, that, that injustice not only happens between individuals, but happens on the social level. And, 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 and keeping the Sixth Commandment means counteracting injustice societally as well. Within the church, within the, church uh, uh, the, the assembly understood our union in Christ as demanding a deep concern for one another's practical well-being. And it's chapter on the communion uh, of believers uh, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, the assembly obligate, says that they, they obligated fellow believers to, quote, the performance of such duties, public and private, as do conduce to their mutual good, both in an inward and outward man. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 26, article 1. Okay, now I want you to notice that. Uh, 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 that, that we, are, that we are, are obliged to the performance of duties, uh, public and private, all right? That, that means not just, not just what you happen to do as you, as you encounter a, 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 another uh, individual that just impacts their individual lives, but what you do publicly, what you do in your civil engagement, the way you spend your money, the way you vote, the way you, uh, the, the, the systems that you promote, what you do publicly, right? Um, that we, we, we have, a, we have a, a particular calling as brothers and sisters in Christ, as united to a people um, um, comprised of, of believers from every tribe and nation and tongue, joined in Christ, baptized in Christ. We have an obligation to look after the interests of diverse believers who are also baptized in Christ. When we were joined to Jesus, we were joined to everybody that Jesus is joined to. And, 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 as, 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 and, and, and we aren't just joined in, 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 a, in, a, in a spiritual, immaterial way. Jesus joins us together so that we actually look after one another's practical well-being, both in our private and our civil lives, to promote one another's spiritual and physical social well-being. Notice that the assembly didn't just say in the inward man, but they also said and the outward man, and the outward man. And so the gospel calls believers to act on one another's behalf in both private and civil lives to, again, to promote one another's well-beings. And I just want us to think about, uh, and, and as I think Matt laid this out beautifully. He says, well, what, what would that have meant in the history of America if we had just obeyed this part of, uh, this, this one article in the Westminster Confession of Faith, just this part of our tradition, if we had just been faithful to look after one another's well-being in the inward and outward man, what would that have mean, meant? I think that would have been an absolutely revolutionary idea that would have changed the whole history of our country. It would have changed the whole history of our country, certainly the slave system, Jim Crow, the lynching tree, segregation, if Christians had simply faithfully adhered to this one point in the tradition. If we had understood our union with one another as demanding that, they, that we protect one another's practical well-being, the practical well-being of our fellow Christians. So I'm only really scratching the surface here. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm moving quickly for the sake of time here. And I'm just, like I said, I'm just scratching the surface uh, at, at some of the confessions exposition of the law and really just at one point. 
Uh, but, but as we consider the question of what has Geneva to do with Ferguson, it's expounded even more when we consider Reformed eschatology, Reformed eschatology. And, and Dr. Matt didn't talk that much about eschatology, uh, he, uh, but, but it was always sort of in the background here because Calvin's understanding of the twofold government and the political significance of the kingdom of Christ is rooted in his eschatology, his doctrine of the end, thing, the end times, his, his doctrine of, 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 of the not yet that, that is breaking in by way of the Spirit of God, by way of the gospel of Christ into the already. Okay? I'm going to actually quote Dr. Matt here if he doesn't mind and he won't charge me money for quoting him. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, he puts it this way. God's reign over the world appears in the form of two different governments. This is talking about Calvin's doctrine of two kingdoms. One corresponding to the present earthly life and one corresponding to the future and spiritual kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of Christ, which will one day reorder the entire creation, has been inaugurated with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But, but its full consummation awaits the Christ's second coming. The anticipatory form of that that kingdom takes in the present is the church in which the gospel is preached. And so, and so, as we think of ourselves, we have to think of ourselves as the anticipatory form uh, that the kingdom takes. When God, and we've heard this uh, repeatedly, but I think it bears repeating again, when, 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 when the world wants to see God's intentions for human relationships and the world, the world ought to be able to look at the church and see that. God has put a picture of, what, of where we're going in this world. The church is an outpost of heaven. We, when, when, the, when the world looks at the church, it, it's supposed to see God's intention for the way in which we treat one another, the way in which we love one another, the way in which we care for one another, the, 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 the way in which resources are meant to be distributed amongst one another. That, that, that's what the church is called to be. And when, when, and, 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 and when we think that, 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 that this kingdom is, is a spiritual kingdom, I don't want you to think immaterial. We don't want to turn into Gnostics here. Uh, I want you to think eschatological. I want you to think new creation. I want you to think the Holy Spirit, the glory of the not yet breaking into the already and giving us a glimpse of what the Lord intends us to be in practical ways. One of, one of Calvin's uh, sort of favorite passages to, to, to exposit uh, the way in which this kingdom uh, comes into the world is Micah chapter 4. You all may remember that Micah chapter 4 really, uh, uh, in Micah chapter 4, the Lord reveals this eschatological vision of the household of God meant to transform who the Lord's people are today in light of who we will be tomorrow. Micah saw a day in which the redemptive glory of God would bring a diverse people from every tribe and nation and tongue into the household of God. And this is what Micah said. Micah said, he shall judge, talking about the Lord himself, he shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. Now, I want you to notice what Micah is saying here, the, uh, 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 and what the Lord himself is saying through Micah, that the Lord himself would not simply dismiss the disputes, that the Lord himself would not uh, pretend as though the disputes weren't, weren't that, that, as if they didn't matter, as, as, as if there, there was just nothing there. Uh, uh, the Lord didn't just cover over disputes, but, but the Lord actually judged between the people. He decided matters of dispute. The Lord ensured justice and repentance and repair and reconciliation between the people so that their reconciliation and their coming together was founded on justice, repentance, and repair. When we come in here, it's not as though we, we just pretend as though there's no baggage or, or we just pretend as though that nothing has happened, right? But, 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 but by the Spirit of God and, and by the power of the gospel, even the longest and most bitter national and ethnic hatreds and conflicts can and will be healed. Micah goes on to say, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. As the word of the Lord is, appri is applied to these ethnic and national divisions and disputes, the people of God 
apply themselves in practical ways to destroying the practical instruments and mechanisms of harm and forging instruments of mutual blessing. That means we've got to talk about, we've got to talk about the sinful ideologies that, that people bring into the church. We've got to talk about the ways in which humans uh, harm one another. And, and, and we've got to practically and, uh, and very intentionally, listen, beat our swords into plowshares. Uh, when Calvin looked at this, he, he thought it meant it, uh, some, some, some intentionality, that we couldn't just come in and, and, and think that it would all be covered over and that we didn't need to, to, to be intentional. But this would require hard work. Scripture goes further to speak not only of the practical instruments, again, but the ideologies and the hatreds that drove the disputes themselves and says that they, too, would be eradicated. It says that nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Again, this peace will become not just a private but a social reality that makes its claims on the material resources of life and makes its claim on practical safety and security that we have amongst one another. This eschatological vision overturns the false notion that justice is mutually exclusive. Remember, the Lord judges between the reconciled people. He judges between the reconciled people. They are all redeemed and reconciled, and yet the Lord is still judging between them, revealing how some were wrong in how they treated others. And some were not as wrong. There was repentance to go around, but, but, but they were still all winners, even where some had to admit they were wrong. They were still all winners, even when some had to repent. They were still all winners, even though some had to repair the damage that had been done. And so we, have a, we can come to the household of God with enough security in Christ and enough gospel security to, re, to actually repent before one another, to have enough uh, 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 grace to say, hey, hey, you know, I may have been wrong in the ways in which I thought about you. I may have been wrong in, which, in the ways in which I've treated you. I may have been wrong in the ways in which I have participated in systems that oppress you, but I'm willing to repent. And I have enough grace and enough, enough uh, confidence that Jesus Christ can heal me and that Jesus Christ can make all things new. See, that, that, that's the hope that we have to have. We, don't have. we don't have to come to one another thinking that, that, that if you win, then I lose. If you get resources, I lose resources. If, if you're on top, that means I'm on bottom. If I ever admit what, what's really going on in our history and what's really going on in our society, then somehow I'm going to lose out. We, we can come with confidence that, 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 that the gospel of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ uh, has enough power in it to actually, listen, listen, make justice roll down, right? Like an amazing waterfall. That, that, that righteousness would keep going forth like a never-ending stream. That, that's not just a little justice. That's a lot of justice. That's more than enough justice for everybody. Supporting the equal value, dignity, and worth of, for instance, black life doesn't undermine the value of blue life. Supporting the equal and dignity of worth uh, of, of, of our Syrian neighbors doesn't undermine the equal dignity and worth of people who are, may be born in the United States. Supporting the equal dignity and worth of folks that, that, that are uh, um, undocumented immigrants here in the, in the States doesn't necessarily undermine the equal dignity and worth of the native born. We can, we can promote the equal dignity and worth and flourishing of all life. And, and right here we see that that's possible. That's possible. Lest we turn from this vision that Micah had as idealistic and practical and unrealistic for today, lest we over-spiritualize this vision and think it has no bearing on how we live out our practical social lives. The Lord ended the passage by saying, for all peoples walk each in the name of its God. 
but we will walk. We will, we will live out practically and socially. We will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. The redemptive reign of Christ has inaugurated a kingdom that makes a claim on every area of life, not just privately, but also socially. The same blood which removes the punishment of our sin in our vertical relationship with God also removes the presence of sin in our horizontal relationships with one another. Calvin says this, when the nations should be taught by the Word of God, there would be such a change that everyone would study to do good and to perform the duties of love toward his neighbors. But by speaking of swords and spears, he briefly intimates what men, until they are made gentle by the Word of God, are ever intent on iniquitous tyranny and oppression. Except then we endeavor to relieve the necessities of our brethren and to offer them assistance, there will not be in us but one part of true conversion. Hear what Calvin is saying? Calvin is saying that if we do not use the Word of God to tear down the instruments of of oppression, if we do not practically endeavor to relieve the necessities of our neighbors, and if we do not practically offer them assistance, then he is saying that we are not fully converted. He is saying that if you do not pursue justice in your life, if you do not seek to, to, uh, to, to, to do it in, in practical ways, both in individual relationships and, and uh, in society, then, then there's something about the kingdom of Christ. There's something about, about the, the, the character of our God. There's something about the Christian life that you are not fully living out. And if we don't answer the question of what has Geneva to do with Ferguson, with faith expressing itself as practical acts of love, then there is something vital missing in our Christianity. And we ought to pray that God would grant it. Amen?